Okay. Okay, so may I start? Okay, so hello everybody. Thank you for attending the lecture. I feel a little bit strange being now on the position, on the position of speaker. Well, however, I enjoy it a lot. And actually, I would like to raise the subject, which can be somewhat controversial, namely whether really an MRL axiometry allows us to inquire into the mechanism of motion. Because as I wrote in the introduction to the lecture, Typically, when we want to advertise the advantages of an MRL axometry, we point out that first, using an MRL axometry, we can uh, probe dynamics in a very broad range just in a single experiment. So this is the one great advantage, the first one. The second one is that we can distinguish between different mechanisms of motions because of different shapes of the spectral density functions. It looks very nice when one wants to write paper or get project funded, because there is actually not many methods in the world which really are able to provide information about the mechanism of molecular and ionic motion, not only the correlation the times or diffusion coefficients and so on. However, I would uh, like to critically discuss the subject, whether this is really true, I mean in practice, because theoretically, yes, theoretically for sure an MR axiometry gives us access to the mechanism of molecular motion, and I will briefly explain how. The problem is whether one is really able always profit from that in practice because actually this is a kind of, you see, I don't know how to put it, there are no perfect things in the world. From one side, one gets a great tool to reveal the mechanism of motion, and one can say that it is so, one can probe the motion on the molecular level, on the atomistic level, in fact, because an MLL axiometry is a quantum mechanical effect. Yes. However, on the other side, because this is a quantum mechanical effect, there's a lot of other factors which influence the relaxation rates. And the problem is that what we really measure in experiments, it's not like how to say directly the spectral density function. We measure a kind of relaxation effect which stems from very different spin interactions multiple relaxation paths. And only then, when we somehow were able to describe the quantum mechanical scenario of the relaxation, only then we can ask the question about the mechanism of motion. And quite often, it is not easy, easy to separate those effects. I will start with something uh, I don't know how I, why I cannot, okay. I will start with something which you know by heart, so I show it very often. So sorry for starting with that, but please treat this, treat this as a kind of introduction. It will not last longer than 10, 15 minutes, and then I will show more interesting things. So as I said, this is something what is very, very typical. You take a kind of standard sample, liquid sample, and you measure relaxation rates, you collect the relaxation dispersion profiles. And well, there's really nothing special in there, in, in the data, they change with temperature. Eventually, when the dynamics becomes slow at low temperatures, we, we exceed the range of the relaxometer and we cannot continue this experiment. Yeah, this is somehow pity for slow motion. But uh, nothing really is happening here. And everybody can perform this type of experiments. And actually, if we look at uh, those, uh, those molecules, 
there's not much quantum mechanics here because the only NMR active nucleus is actually hydrogen. Okay, you can say that uh, there are different functional groups, but this would be important in case, this would be important in the case of high resolution study, high field studies, but not uh, in the case of NMR relaxometry. So somehow we have only one source of relaxation and there are proton-proton-dipole-dipole interactions, generally speaking. So the quantum mechanical side, quantum mechanical aspect of the relaxation is pretty deep. So in principle, for such systems, we are in perfect position to talk about mechanism of motion. But before I switch to the problem of the mechanism of motion, I would like to I would like to give make a kind of remark, which is maybe not much related to the mechanism of motion. However, it gives us something to think about. Sometimes we observe the exponential relaxation, and look, quite often people argue that actually we see B exponential relaxation because we have different pools of protons and there's no exchange between them. I have always problems with such statements because actually even if there is no exchange between different pools of protons, it's not like one kind of protons is how to say put in one corner of the sample and another one in another corner and they are far apart. It's not the case. Please look here, for instance, at the structure of glycerol molecule. After all, there is no exchange between the protons which belong to the OH groups and the other protons. They do not exchange. However, we do not see the exponential relaxation. The problem is that even if there is more than one pool of protons, relaxation is very rarely B exponential because of that. Why? Because there are dipole-dipole interactions between all kinds of protons. For instance, we have dipole-dipole interactions between protons belonging to the hydrogen, the, to the OH, oh yeah, OH groups. We have dipole-dipole interactions between the other kinds of protons. We have dipole-dipole interactions between OH groups and non-OH groups. So somehow the fact that different pools of protons do not exchange does not mean that we are supposed to have B exponential relaxation. So this is a kind of side remark because actually I think quite often I suppose that if we have B exponential relaxation it's just quantum mechanics. It's not because of different pools of protons. However, okay, this was a kind of side remark. Let us come to this problem and we have, of course, single exponential relaxation. Now, okay, the relaxation scenario is pretty simple. Uh, so, in principle, we are in good position to reveal the mechanism of motion. What we expect? Well, we expect actually translation diffusion we expect rotation diffusion of the molecule and a kind of internal dynamics, yeah? And the question is whether we are able to see it in the experiment. Generally, before I address the question, how one can see mechanism of motion? Sorry if this is trivial, but I suppose that in the audience we have people who use an MR axometry for very different purposes, so maybe it makes sense to say something about it. You see, here in this figure, I plotted versus frequency 
spectral density functions for different kinds of motion. Rotation dynamics, isotropic rotation dynamics, three-dimensional translation diffusion, and two-dimensional translation diffusion. Yeah, you can see it clearly here. On the x-axis, you have logarithmic scale. On the y-axis, you have linear scale. I needed to use something. And you see, for instance, here, how much different the shape of those spectral densities are. Okay, how the whole thing works. We have a measured relaxation rate. We know from spin relaxation theories that the relaxation rates are given as linear combinations of so-called spectral density functions. The spectral density functions are Fourier transforms of so-called correlation functions. What a correlation function is? It has a well-defined mathematical uh, formula. It is just like you take, let's say, such a quantity, you take initial position of a particle, you take final position of a particle, you take conditional probability that the particle is in the final position at time t, assuming that it was in the initial position at time zero, and you integrate over all possible initial and final positions. And in end effect, after such integration, you get time correlation function. And the core of those considerations is the conditional probability, which one finds, for instance, from solving diffusion equation. It can be rotation, rotational diffusion equation, it can be translational diffusion equations. Both of them can have different uh, Bandari conditions. But this is how one gets correlation, fu correlation functions. And then when one performs Fourier transform of the correlation function, one gets spectral density functions. So for instance, if correlation function is exponential, Fourier transform of an exponential function is Lorentzian. Then you get Lorentzian spectral density and so on, so on, so on. And actually the solid line here represents Lorentzian spectral density. Clearly translation diffusion is not described in this way. So as the relaxation rate is given as a sum of such spectral densities, we can think that looking at the shape of the relaxation dispersion profile, if we can somehow reveal the shape of the spectral density and therefore the mechanism of motion. Okay. So coming back to the data which we have already. So here, yeah, here, when we look for instance at glycerol, we have intermolecular and intramolecular dipole-dipole interaction. And you will remember the lecture about uh, molecular dynamic simulations and when we address the question whether the models which we use are appropriate and actually it turned out that they are not. That actually our simple models describing motion in liquid is far from what molecular dynamics tells us. But then I asked a kind of provocative question. I mean, two questions, in fact, because I said, well, from one side, I understand that. From the other side, actually, the simple analytical models fit. And there's also first side to that. They give good uh, agreement with other methods. However, OK, for sure you agree that we have relaxation contribution, two relaxation contributions. One of them is associated with the intramolecular dipole-dipole interactions and the another one with the intermolecular dipole-dipole interactions. Okay, 
let us sum out the intramolecular vapor vapor current. Forget for a while about this three factor, one quite often calls, by, calls it by polar relaxation constant. But here you have something what is well known, namely combination, sum of two spectral densities taken at the resonance frequency plus four times the spectral density taken at twice the resonance frequency. And here is the question, what is the shape of the spectral density? Four rotation dynamics. And here is something what I really do not like, although some times I use it. Actually, we also discussed this thing, I remember, some time ago. Actually, I want to say that this is only my personal opinion, but I do not like it. It's, um, I mean, I don't want to say that it is incorrect. I'm just not convinced. Well, it is sometimes so. Because you see, this is this well known Cole Davidson form of spectral density quite often used to describe rotation dynamics. If beta is equal to one, you end up with Lorentzian spectral density, which corresponds to exponential correlation function and can really in quite good, uh, and it's theoretically, and I think also in practice in quite good approximation, describes isotropic rotation of spherical symmetric molecules. The point is that for many molecules, it does not work. And therefore people insert here this factor beta to have one more uh, parameter. I just think that it is to help the fitting to be better. However, it does not have much physical meaning it only merely tells us that actually the rotational dynamics of, in this, uh, this case, glycerol molecules is not really isotropic. There is also different pools of protons, as I already said at the beginning. There is also a kind of internal dynamics. So to me, just using this, uh, this type of model only somehow underlies that really we are far from treating the rotation dynamics of uh, glycerol as isotropic and described by uh, exponential correlation function. But that's all. And this is a kind of practical way to get out if one is not very much interested in the details of the rotation dynamics, but one wants to fit the data. But as I said, this is only personal opinion. Then we have this old Huang and Fried model when one describes isotropic translation diffusion. By isotropic, I understand three-dimensional diffusion. This is something what you know very well. So this is also a kind of prefactor here. This is a kind of integral. Yeah, this is something which what people know very well. And actually here we have something which is called translation correlation time. Here we have rotation correlation time. And this quantity is defined something like relative translation diffusion coefficient. It's twice larger than self-diffusion coefficient for identical molecules. If we deal with non-identical molecules, it's just the sum of the diffusion coefficients of the individual molecules. And D is called distance of closest approach. How close two molecules can be? Well, actually, this is a very simple model. It's called like hard uh, force field hard, uh, a force free hard sphere model, which actually means that the molecules are treated as hard spheres, or you have spheres, slash spherical, yeah, and the molecules are put inside, all protons are put in the center of the molecules, and this is more or less what they do. And of course, it is even far, even 
more far from the reality than the concept of isotropic rotation. However, okay, this is what one does. And if one applies this type of models, the point is that one gets excellent P. Look here at the glycerol data. You have contribution from the intra, intramolecular part, which is supposed to describe the, how to say, semi-rotation dynamics. The beta is 0 0.6 here, or 0 0.7, I do not remember, but something like that. And here you have the contribution at lower frequencies associated with translation dynamics, which is modeled in this way. Actually, according to Stokes-Einstein equation, this ratio is nine. So it's not surprising that the translation, that the relaxation contribution associated with translation dominates at lower frequencies. And if you look at those speeds, here, you see, I would say what more one can need. Even if one applies more sophisticated models, more close to being more close to reality, they will include more parameters. And this is even mathematically a kind of problem, because actually, for whatever reason, it turns out that the very, very simplified, I would say even oversimplified from a, a point of view of a kind of common sense models are able to fit the data very well. I'm not sure that this is a kind of advantage. But um, on the other hand, one can say, no, okay, so try fit the data just not using how to say translation plus rotation spectral densities, but try to fit the data using, I don't know, two rotation like contributions. This will not work. So maybe this is a kind of optimistic effect that to some extent the data are really sensitive to the mechanism of motion. But on the other hand, at least for liquids, it turns out that it's sufficient to just, I don't know, capture the essential features of the motion, and that's it. You can fit the data there. Okay. There is something, a kind of mathematical trick, namely this spectral density function given by Huang and Fried. One can uh, expand into Taylor series at low frequencies. And then it will turn out that actually, if you plot the relaxation rate, not the logarithm of the relaxation rate, but the relaxation rate itself, versus square root of the resonance frequency, at low frequencies, one is supposed to get a straight line. And this is a fingerprint of three-dimensional translation diffusion. Then from that, you can determine the, the diffusion coefficient here. You need only to know something which is called the number of protons per unit volume, and you can determine it knowing the structure of the molecule. And usually one knows what one measures. So, this is a kind of straightforward way to determine the translation diffusion coefficient. And moreover, uh, it gives information whether the diffusion is isotropic, I mean, two dimensional, or not. And actually, if you determine in this way the translation diffusion coefficients, and you compare that with uh, just direct measurements, by pass field gradient, this is this level of agreement which you get. The open symbols are from literature from field gradient methods. So, well, I would say the document is very good. Okay. I mean, one can hardly discuss with the results. 
but then this is also the question which I ask uh, at some at some moments during the series of lectures, because if I apply this model, which I know that it just um, should not work, because really assuming uh, this. Uh, the hard sphere concept and so on. It is all, it's just so oversimplified. So in principle, not checking that one will say there's no way that it works. However, applying it, one gets very good agreement as far as the translation diffusion coefficients are concerned. And the point is that if one applies a different correlation function, probably such one obtained from uh, MD simulations. The point is which diffusion coefficients one would get. This is what I would very much like to try. That for instance, somebody calculates just the intermolecular correlation function for glycerol or whatever, something very simple using MD simulations. And then we plug in this uh, correlation function to the general expression and whether the diffusion coefficients which we would get from that would fit to the gradient, to this one obtained by the gradient methods or not. This is what I would very much like to check. However, okay, we are at this position now. Then you see, I pointed out at the beginning that it's very important to establish the quantum mechanical scenario of the relaxation process. Because for glycerol, it was very simple. But look, here you have ionic liquid. And this is fluorine relaxation, actually. And here this cation includes protons. But one could say, well, if you perform fluorine relaxation, you can, how to say, monitor, the, can probe the diffusion of the ion. And you perform proton relaxation, you get the diffusion of the cation. And actually, you can apply already the model which you present. Now, you see, we fitted the data, and we also find diffusion coefficient as a part of the fit, but definitely not in the way as we described uh, previously. Because why? You see, this contribution, which in fact dominates the feed, stems from not fluor fluor intermolecular interionic motion, the dipole dipole interactions, but it stems from dipole dipole coupling between fluor and proton, which is modulated by the relative translation dynamics of the cation and anion. The point is that you, I suppose that you know that if you have two non-equivalent nuclei like fluor, fluor and proton, and there's dipole dipole coupling between them, the relaxation rate is given by a different combination of spectral density functions, and one of the uh, one of the spectral density is taken at the difference between the resonance frequencies of both nuclei. It actually because the resonance frequency of proton and fluor is very close, so the difference is very low. It's almost like taking, I don't know, spectral density at zero frequency. And you see what is happening here. For instance, this contribution goes down, but it does not drop here like one could expect for the fluor fluor contribution, but it goes down quite in a quite smooth way. And it happens because of the spectral density taken at the difference between the proton and fluor resonance frequencies. So somehow, before one concludes that one that those relaxation data, the shape of the data, are a fingerprint of the mechanism of motion, one must be aware that it goes only via a proper combination of the spectral densities. And this is a kind of 
example should serve as a one. What more? Here I took uh, a kind, I prepared a kind of table, what we know from mathematical viewpoint about the possible shapes of spectral densities. So we have this Huang and Fried and Ayant, this happened in the same year, the said uh, integral for the three dimensional translation diffusion. It's good to know that, thanks to Pascal Fries, who probably is not in the audience, uh, he derived a form of spectral density for two-dimensional translation diffusion. The disadvantage of this form is a lack of clear prefactor here. However, the general feature is that the spectral density yeah, depends in such a way on the logarithm of such expression. For one dimensional diffusion, it turned out that one can hardly solve the diffusion equation in one dimension. So general expression is not available. However, we have a kind of limiting expression. And here in the low field limit, or rather in this limit, yeah, because it stems from the Taylor expansion of the spectral density functions, but of course this condition that the product is much smaller than one is of course fulfilled the low frequencies. You see here you have this for the three dimensional diffusion, you have this effect which I already described that the spectral density is a linear function of the square root of frequency. Here, in this limit, the spectral density is just a linear function of logarithm of the frequency. And for one-dimensional diffusion, the spectral density just is like one over square root of the resonance frequency. So there are a kind of uh, general features, of mathematical features of the uh, spectral density functions, which can be used to identify the mechanism of motion. However, again, the warning, please remember about this figure, everything can be obscured by the quantum mechanical phenomena, for instance, the need of using relaxation expressions for two non-equivalent nuclei. With this knowledge, let us start to look at other I took effort to make some simulations. So for instance, again, I, uh, I simulated spectral density functions, functions for different kinds of motion. So here you have rotation dynamics. Here, you see, this is versus the yeah, frequency in the logarithmic scale. So, according to the table which we have here, in this representation, two-dimensional translation dynamics should form a speed line. It does. In this representation, when instead of logarithm of the resonance frequency, I have square root of the resonance frequency, three-dimensional diffusion forms a split line, and so on. So there are ways to put the data into some representations to figure out what is the mechanism of the translation motion. Yeah, such a picture, if in such a presentation you have street line, you have two-dimensional diffusion. If in such a presentation you have street line, you have three-dimensional diffusion. The point is that if you do not, it depends what the system is. If there is not much complexity from the quantum mechanical theory of the relaxation and you are really sure about the forms of the spectral density, I mean the relaxation expressions which you use, you can draw your conclusions. But if you have systems like 
no clothing button of law, false false, and look labels, I think, for the whole moment. Then it might be that the deviations come from the quantum mechanical part. Quite often, people just perform relaxation experiments at a single frequency. We know that very well. We are actually in this quite comfortable situation that we can make it versus magnetic. And then people perform it versus temperature. And you see, if you lose the mathematical uh, expressions for, uh, if you use the mathematical expressions for the spectral density functions, and you assume Arrhenius dependence on the of the correlation time then you can also get some information about the mechanics of the, of the motion. But, 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 quite often, this is a kind of misinterpretation here. For instance, here the solid lines, the blue lines, they just show, they show uh, spectral density functions versus uh, reciprocal temperature at two different frequencies. And quite often people argue that because of, uh, because the uh, relaxation rates, experimental relaxation rates, coincide at this high temperature flank, then we deal with rotation dynamics. This is not true. The same applies for translation dynamics. Just always, if the motion is very fast, so there is no, and this happens usually at high temperature, so there is not much dependence on the frequency, the data will coincide in this flank here. So this is not really a fingerprint of anything. To get really a kind of um, idea whether we deal with translation or rotation dynamics, one just has to look at the shape. Because actually the shape, the overall shape for the uh, rotation, I mean Lorentzian function, and for the translation is different. Then there's a kind of trick. You see, you would not expect that probably, but it's good to know. If I take one frequency, um, okay, here, uh, what, what will happen? I, let's assume that those lines represent real data. I assume uh, <coughs> I assume certain activation energy, a kind of typical one, and I plotted those curves, and I put a kind of symmetric line. You see, for three-dimensional diffusion, this is what you get. It's just this. Is this a red? Uh, is this a red line? And for two-dimensional diffusion is this black line. And what you should see here, the data, the lines almost coincide here on this flank, this high temperature flank. This is what I said here. Really taking into account some experimental error you can hardly distinguish here between translation and uh, between three-dimensional and two-dimensional motion. But if you are happy and you are able to go via the maximum, then you will see very important thing. Namely, for two-dimensional diffusion, the line is not symmetrical. Here, this line is a minor uh, reflection of two-dimensional spectral density, just here, taken here. So this line 
is just mirror, mirror reflection of that. And you see that on this side, you see huge difference. Just two-dimensional translation diffusion in this representation is not symmetric. I suppose that people really do not wonder much about that. But you see, the fact that we perform experiments versus frequency, we also change temperature. So we can also draw such a picture at different, at different frequencies, just versus the reciprocal temperature. And I think at some frequencies, we'll be able to catch both sides. And then looking whether the line is symmetrical or not, we can guess whether we have three-dimensional or two-dimensional diffusion. I think that people do not think about this effect very often. So this was a kind of playing with the forms of the spectral density. Now I would like to show you some examples. So here is the table to remember it. Then there are data. Sorry, I should have put uh, the reference. There are data for uh, some, it's called derma fillers, just some uh, hyaluronic acid-based hydrogels that are used in cosmetology. And we had here several kinds of uh, the dermal fillers and we perform relaxation experiments. We see water here in this experiment. Actually, this work has been published. This is open access paper. It has been published by us recently in ChemFiscam. And what I would like to show here, you see, I make a kind of trick. Namely, for those one, two, three data, I just, I mean, what I did, I multiplied the data in such a way so they overlap, they coincide in the low frequency range. I just multiply the whole profiles via something, or you can say that I normalize it to unity. So how to say, or oh, maybe this is better. Just the low frequency relaxation rate has been put to one. Yeah, so the whole data was divided by some factor. And the first thing which I figure out here that actually those three data sets coincide, in fact, and those two are different, although mostly here, because here they are similar. Not going into details, here you see a very nice linear dependence of the relaxation rate on the logarithm of the frequency. You are exactly here. This is a very nice fingerprint of two-dimensional translation diffusion. It really happens in the nature. Here you have, uh, here you have something else, namely there are some data for solid systems containing lithium. And actually, well, lithium diffusion is a very complex problem. I do not want to inquire much into how the data have been analyzed. I can say more about that later, maybe, because actually you see lithium is a kind of tricky thing because the lithium relaxation is not driven by delta dipole coupling, but by quadrupolar coupling. Lithium has been very hard. However, not going into details, we are able to identify also to reproduce the data using the model of uh, two-dimensional translation diffusion. But then you can tell me, wait, wait. Here you had linear scale, and here you had logarithmic scale, and here you say that for two-dimensional diffusion, this is linear in this representation. But here you have linear dependence in logarithmic, logarithmic scale. So something is wrong because you again say that this is two-dimensional. Look, the full expression is like that. This is only the low field approximation. 
So for instance, if we look for three-dimensional translation motion, here we have this linear dependence here at low frequencies. But if the motion becomes slower and slower and slower, we will start losing this linearity range. And eventually you will not observe this, how to say, low frequency fingerprint, although we'll be still dealing with three-dimensional translation motion. So sometimes it's like that, that the motion is too slow. So we are not in the range, not in this range. And those expressions do not hold. However, those ones do. And this is this kind of example. This is why I didn't want to discuss the data in much detail, the analysis, because here I put a kind of Com picture of all complex spin interactions which one has to take into account to properly describe this kind of data. And this is what people quite often forget because one is focused only on the mechanism of motion, which means the form of the spectral density. The point is that if you do not have the quantum mechanical part right, for instance, you have I don't know, total fluor relaxation. However, anyway, you use the combination of spectral density J omega plus 4 J2 omega, you will get nonsense. First, one must have proper combination of spectral density. And this depends on the which nuclei of which spin quantum number contribute to the system and so on. And this is a very difficult problem because there are not really recipes which you can find in a textbook. At the end, I would like to, is this the last one? Yes. This serves as a kind of conclusion. This is what I'm working on now. It's a paper which I'm uh, writing. And actually, I even took the data like, I don't know, uh, 10 minutes before uh, the lecture. I just decided to show them. You see, this is example of ionic liquid in silica matrix, trapped in silica matrix. What people believe? People believe that actually we have two-dimensional diffusion in confinement because there is two-dimensional motion near the surfaces, yeah? And this is this famous expression by Rainer Kimmich and uh, also the uh, other expressions by Jean-Pierre Corp, and we quite often use them. Personally, I believe that quite often the diffusion near surfaces is really to dimension. However, one should always be sure. And there's not a rule that it is like that. Because look, here I just plotted the data versus square root of frequency. It's very hard to get good data sets in confinement. However, um, yeah. I think one can claim that this dependence is linear. Here you can say that, well, in this scale, everything is linear. I can enlarge it. However, even myself, if I would have only this figure, I would say, no, okay, I really do not have arguments that this is not three-dimensional diffusion. However, I would have some, I would hesitate a little. However, here, this is for this data set. I can show you also the same thing for fluor, I mean for the anions. Uh, really, it seems that for this system, although we are in the confinement and we look at the diffusion near surfaces, we still deal with three dimensional process. However, treat this as a warning. If you apply the Kimmich equation, you will fit the data. There are so many parameters in this expression that you will get excellent fit. You can calculate the cutoff frequency of the morph and so on. 
the agreement will be very good. I don't want to question this expression. As I think what I would like to say is that actually, well, you can make also the simple test. And from one side, this expression fits. From the second side, you have just here a very nice fingerprint of three-dimensional diffusion, just like that. So, well, this is all what I wanted to tell you today. I do not have much questions except of, I don't know, this was a kind of report on what one can get out from the data, from an ML hexometry data, just some examples. I hope it was okay. So thank you.